everyone. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you for your patience with our technical setup. We're sort of ready just in time. We're delighted to have all of you here. A number of months ago, we heard from a colleague at the Montauk Library that they had had a wonderful speaker who was a sea captain. And a woman, because as you know, that's a little bit unusual, maybe. I think so. So we uh, were able to be in touch with Pat, and she agreed to be here, and we're delighted to have her. And I'll tell you just a few things about her, and she'll tell you a bunch more. But um, she has worked as a, as a ship's de deck officer, as an operations integrity specialist and technical research writer. Um, she retired from Sea River Maritime of the U.S. Coast Guard. She's worked as a journalist. She took a transatlantic trip. You have to tell us about that. <laughs> from the U.S. to England. Uh, that, um, you have to tell us about that. And she was a restoration project manager of a 57-foot classic sailboat. She served for two years as the executive director of the Shelter Island Historical Society. And she is currently the owner of East End Charters, LLC, which operates a, f a fleet of crude sailing, C-R-E-W-E-D, <laughs> sailing and motor vessels. Now, she'll tell you more, but let's get started. So please welcome Pat Mooney. very much. Uh, it, thank you for being here on a stormy, rainy, horrible day like today. We came from the North Fork and got stuck in the trade parade and the rain at the same time. But anyway, I'm happy to be here. Um, it's always interesting to try to <clears throat> do a talk and sum up your whole life in 30 minutes. <laughs> it doesn't even make sense to me, but I will try to make, make it sense for you. Um, I was born in Montauk in 1957. Uh, my mother always said that you know we, we were quite poor in Montauk, but she said we didn't have two nickels to rub together, but we had it all, and that was absolutely true. It was gorgeous out there. It was you know eons before the fabulous Hamptons even engulfed Montauk. So anyway, I thought I would start talking about <clears throat> my father because that's how we all wound up in Montauk. Um, this is my father in 1947, uh, or 48, I believe, and I, I can't believe there's anybody in the room who doesn't know who my father is, but just in case, my father is Frank Mundus, who is the shark guy from Montauk, and uh, sharks pretty much were a daily part of our life, and <clears throat> he and my mother got married, and they lived in New Jersey. <clears throat> First of all, I should back up a little bit to tell you about my father. He, he was raised in Brooklyn and he fell off a roof, jumping from one building to the other, broke his arm and developed osteomyelitis, which in the 20s, uh, he was born in 25, there was no cure for it. So he spent most of his childhood in bed and they thought he was going to die. Uh, I think he finally graduated from eighth grade at 18 or 19. And he lived because his family doctor said, move that kid to the beach, maybe, maybe he'll have success if he wants to be outside and he's around the ocean. So they moved to New Jersey. And uh, he did. And when he bounced back, he bounced back with a vengeance. So <clears throat> he married my mother, who uh, was only about five foot two, but she was a powerhouse. And they had a boat in New Jersey. They decided that they wanted to make a, a living together with a charter boat, so they had a bigger boat built in 1947, and they brought it to Montauk in 1951. In the 50s, Montauk was a really happening outdoorsman's place. The train went there, and the Long Island Railroad had a special called the Fisherman Special. So for two or three dollars, whatever it was, you could get on the train and go to Montauk, fish the whole day, and then get back on the train and they put ice in your igloo and you could bring your fish home. So they were recruited to come to Montauk. And 
Yeah, that's my mother and my father. And in those days, I'm having trouble with this microphone. Can everybody hear me? Okay? No, no, no. We, we need it. We, we really need it. You need it. Okay. Uh, Montauk wasn't called Montauk Harbor. In fact, Montauk Harbor wasn't even where the fishing boats were. All the boats, the whole fleet, was next to the train station in Fort Palm Bay, and they called it Fishangri La, <laughs> which is a, a catchy marketing uh, idea. Um, and they they did move to Montauk Harbor, but it wasn't until I would say the middle fifties, I guess, because my father talked about building his own dock to bring the boat into Montauk Harbor. Um, they, my older sister, who's ten years older than me, they they lived on the boat because there was no housing. So the boat would go fishing in the morning, and then my mother would push my sister around in a baby carriage all day long. Uh, and then the boat would come back, they'd hose everything down, my mother would move back on board, make dinner and sleep on the boat and get off the next day. Um, so it was quite, a, quite an operation. <clears throat> and while he was uh, doing what everybody else was doing in Montauk, was basically catching striped bass and bluefish, he realized that chumming raised sharks. And he caught on right away uh, that people loved catching sharks, so he kind of marketed the whole shark thing just to, to you know, to book more charters. It was his uh, his marketing strategy. But at the same time, you know, still marketing sharks, he did what everybody else was doing in the fifties. They had three kids and a dog and went to work. Uh, that's my older sister Barbara, and that's me, uh, and my mother and father. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> I couldn't resist. It's a cute yeah. picture. <laughs> and, and people always ask me, well, when did, when did you first learn how to swim? And when did you first learn how to maneuver around on a boat? And frankly, I, I can't even remember. You can see I was probably hardly even able to walk and I was already getting dragged on the boat. So. What's the dog's name? Chicky. <laughs> And, you know, notice the date on there, that's 1959. So when you see some of these pictures, especially the ones about the sharks and whales, you have to understand that in 1959, it was not shocking to kill whales. It was not against the law. And uh, white sharks loved whale meat. Without whales as bait, there would be no white sharks. So he, he just went out hunting for whales, harpoon whales, brought it back to the beach, cut them up, and ground them into chum. And so you see, it was a nice, normal childhood. I mean, we, <laughs> sharks and whales and, you know, it's like everything's normal. But that was my older sister and me, so it, from the very earliest memories that I have, he was marketing, shark fishing, using his kids and his family. We kind of were like a, a marketing ploy. It's really not too much different from what you would see in Montauk right now. You know, they still do the same thing. The clothes are different and the telephone number is different, but you get the idea. And that's me. So there was never any shortage of sharks in my life, or boats. The little guy there is me standing on the ice with my father. And then I have a younger sister also. She's five years younger. She uh, married a moniker. She lives in Springs. So we spent a lot of our time on the boat. Meanwhile, he, he was ramping up his uh, monster fishing concept. And the more of those big, bloody, nasty looking sharks that he threw on the dock, the more charters that he sold. So really, uh, despite the whole theme in Jaws where Captain Quint had this revenge for evil and this deep-seated regret that he had to get over. He, he didn't have anything like that. He was a very astute hunter, which kind of made it hard as a father because I couldn't get away with anything. But he also was practicing some really crafty marketing even before people were really talking about marketing. He was just throw the... That was one of his expressions, that chartering is 90% show and 10% go. And he sold a lot of charters and supported his family. I put this picture in here because <clears throat> there are still people who, who question whether or not Jaws was based on my father. And you can see that, you know, that, that portrait right there is one of the ones 
that uh, kind of came across in JAWS. I can remember, I left home in 1975, and I can remember my father coming home from a charter one day, and he said, you know, the weirdest thing is, my charter today wasn't a charter at all. It wasn't a group at all. It was one guy, and all he wanted to do was talk about fishing. He didn't want to fish. He just wanted to ride around and talk about fishing. Well, that was Peter Benchley. So the idea, there really was a white shark that size. It was 4,500 pounds. It was caught with harpoons, several harpoons, several barrels. The engine broke down. It was, you know, the story was there. And those are the jaws from that particular fish. So even the idea of cutting the jaws out and boiling them in the garage, I mean, it's all, that stuff is all true. It's all true. And, you know, that's my father in his element. Without all the TV hype or the news stories, you know, he, uh, he just loved being out, out there, and he was a really good hunter, and he didn't mind getting dirty or messy as long as you came home catching fish at the end of the day. Again, using, using my little sister, using me. That one, he couldn't resist taking, taking a, a trophy picture with that fish. It says 256 pounds. And his whole idea was that he said that women and children were the best anglers because they listen. Because when you catch a world record fish, you don't do it all by yourself. It's not just one guy fishing. There's somebody coaching, there's somebody watching, there's somebody driving the boat. It's a teamwork effort. So he liked to take these pictures of children and, and particularly girls to show that if a girl could do it, anybody could do it. <laughs> and they went to the boat show every year in New York at the Coliseum and they had a whole dog and pony show that they brought with them, fish, pictures, posters, all to sell charters. So that's me about 17, just about the time where I kind of had uh, my fill of fishing and fishing boats and being the daughter of a, a strange shark person. So I came home one day and I told my father, this was 1974, that I wanted to work on sailboats. And I thought I was going to get kicked out of the house. He went ballistic. <clears throat> He said sailboats were for seagoing tourists. There was no value at all. And I'm like, but Daddy, I, I want to work on them. I, I want to you know, get paid for working on these boats. And he just really couldn't fathom it. So this boat, I took him. This boat, actually, I sailed all the way to Labrador on. Um, it was a really terrific trip. But I took my father on a sailing trip with the captain because I was really trying to get through to him what these boats were all about. And we had a great sail. And at the end, after a few hours, I said, so Daddy, what do you think? And he said, well, I don't know. You sail here, you sail there, you sail here, you sail there, but the only place you sail is back home again. I don't get it. So he never really let go of that idea that sailboats were just frivolous. And I, of course, I love being at sea. I, I love the whole idea that you could travel around the world without any fuel. I mean, this was you know, decades before people started thinking about carbon footprints or anything like that, but it certainly made a lot of sense to me. And I spent a lot of time in the Caribbean, a lot of time in the Bahamas, and I did that for maybe three years, sailing back and forth between the East Coast and the Caribbean. And I happened to be sitting in a bar in Bermuda in the middle of a hot afternoon, and I'm having a Heineken, and the guy sitting next to me, I didn't know it at the time, but he was a captain for Mobile Oil a ship captain. And he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm working on sailboats, and right now we're halfway, we're bringing a boat to Cape Cod. He goes, how do you like that? Now, I was uh, 19 years old. I was too young to even understand that I was complaining about feminist issues, but what I said to him is, well, I really like it. I like being offshore, I like the rhythm, I like the workload, I, I like being small in a big universe. But whenever something really difficult happens on the boat, they stick me on the wheel and they teach somebody else how to handle the problem. I said, I'm not learning anything more. I, I got to a certain level and I don't get it. I, you know, they care about what I look like in a bathing suit, but they don't teach me anything more evolved. I didn't even, I was so naive, I didn't even know that I was complaining about feminist issues. So he said, 
Well, now they start, they're letting women in maritime academies. You can go to a university that teaches maritime studies. You can learn everything you need to know and more. You get a giant license and you get a four-year college education. And you only work six months a year. ka -ching! That appealed to me. So I went, wound up going to Fort Schuyler, which is the New York State Maritime Academy. It's in the Bronx right under the Thrives Neck Bridge. See the ship fight up there? And I started in 1977. I think we had 11 girls in my class. Um, the first women that actually went to sea professionally was in 1976. That was only one woman. The class before me had four women in it. The class before that had three women in it. So I, was in, I wasn't the first, but I was in that first wave. And trust me, they did not want us there. So, you know, we took regular scholastic classes. We studied navigation and, and you know, all of the physics, math, navigation, fluid dynamics, strength of materials, all that stuff. And I, you know, I love being at sea. Even if I had to wear a uniform, even if I had to be on a 500-foot ship with 600 other guys, I, I still love going to sea. And um, this was my first ship as a cadet observer. Um, you know, you have to go to sea as an apprentice because you need X amount of sea time. And if your grades are good enough, they put you out on a merchant ship to practice your apprenticeship. So I spent three weeks on this ship. It was a gasoline carrier. And got a pretty good education on how dirty and filthy and grungy a gasoline tanker is. Um, so that was 1978. And it was a horrible ship, actually. <laughs> the, the captain was from Alabama, and he was really drunk all the time. Uh, his name was Blackie Bristow. And the first thing I did when I left, I had my cadet uniform on and letter of introduction, and then brought it up. And I'm like here, standing in front of the captain's desk. And he didn't even look at me. He said, I don't like blacks, and I don't like goddamn women. <laughs> He said, I'm not going to have anything to do with you. So I spent three weeks with, you know, the captain not talking to me and learned from the chief mate. Uh, I graduated in 1981 and immediately got a ship. Within a week of get, having my license in my hand, I was on the ship. And um, the way it works is a junior officer is a third mate and then you sail as a junior officer until you have enough sea time, then you sail as a second mate. You get another block of sea time, you, sail, you, know, you have to take a new license each time until you reach captain. So this was, um, I went to Alaska a lot back and forth to load the uh, Prudhoe Bay oil. And the ships were not really big, but certainly a lot bigger than yachts. And I met my husband about that time, and I went to sea on ships for 17 years, which is a lot longer than most men do, and certainly women don't usually stay that long, but I did because I had a great person at home who supported me. He was an incredible advocate. He believed in you know, all kinds of civil rights. Uh, he, he believed in the underdog, and without him being my backup guy, I didn't think I could have done it. So that's what Alaska looks like for three or four months of the year when you're going back up and forth. And there's nothing really you can do except just slow down and turn the ship into the waves and just figure out the right rhythm so that you ride through it without breaking anything. Um, I went through the Panama Canal many, many, I don't even know how many times, dozens of times. The Suez Canal many times, and you know what I have to say about the the ship. I've been retired for 20 years, so it, these pictures are all at least 30 or 35 years old. Um, you know, I learned as much about diversity as they did having us on board. We we were all learning together, and for them, a lot of these guys had very little education. They had not ever met a a, a, a woman who was college educated, certainly not nobody who had ever been in charge, but they went with it and we went with it and we kind of all learned how to get along. And um, 
I still have some good friends from those days. And it was hard. That's Alaska also in the wintertime, freezing cold. Yachts are better. <laughs> I, you know, then I would come home. I mean, I, have two, I would be on the ship either two months or three months at a time for every day in those days. Every day I was on a ship, I would get a day of paid leave, paid vacation. So it was worth it. And what my husband and I did to sort of decompress from the stress of, of being out there was we had a 28-foot cache with no engine. And it was a great, great boat. That's Northwest Creek in East Hampton near uh, Sack Harbor. You can take the girl out of Montauk, but you can't take the Montauk out of the girl. So we had this boat, we restored her. It's a Verity Skiff bass boat, uh, built in 1951. She's a really great boat. And I spent a lot of time <clears throat> sailing in Europe on classic boats, very elegant classic yacht regattas. Uh, I, I, we actually won our class in our division on this boat, and the King of Spain gave us our trophy. It was really great. So I said, thank you, sire. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I, I, loved, I loved being at sea, and it didn't matter to me what kind of boats they were, and I, I spent a lot of time traveling all over the place, getting involved with all kinds of boats. Um, I had friends in Holland who were classic uh, workboat fans, so I learned a lot about sailing on classic boats in Holland. I had a friend who was uh, had a narrow boat in England, so we did a lot of canal cruising. It's a really it's a really interesting boat. It's 65 feet long and seven feet wide. <laughs> it's like driving a railroad car. It's fun. So it didn't matter to me what kind of boats they were, or you know, just on the water. Uh, that's Indonesia. There's a lot of work boats, even still today, work wooden work boats that carry cargo in, in Indonesia. I went fishing with the fishermen in Bali on these incredible trimarans. The the main hull is a dugout canoe, and they have two armas for stabilizing. But look at look at the way they're rigged. They're all just held together with Spanish windlasses, and just pieces are only found on the beach. I love antique boats. This is a 1932 canoe, antique sailing canoe. <laughs> That's the North Fork. So you see, it doesn't matter to me what I'm sailing on. It, as long as I'm around the water, I'm happy. This is in the Bahamas. Uh, my husband Earl and I would spend a lot of time in the Bahamas. This, uh, this is a small class of Bahamian racing sloop. And this is one of the most interesting trips we did. There's an old saying that this, the amount of pleasure you get out of a boat is proportional, inversely proportional to its size. A small boat immediately puts you in a wilderness situation, especially one that has no communications, no electronics, no nothing. That, on that cart, is a boat. It's a, it's a folding kayak designed in 1914. And one duffel bag has the frame, <clears throat> and the other duffel bag has the skin, and the third duffel bag had the, the sails and a tiny, little tiny bit of provision that we, we took with us. So we hired that plane to drop us in a really remote place. We put the boat together, and we sailed the whole Exuma chain in a 17-foot uh, kayak. <laughs> it was really, it was a great trip. We carried, well, we hunted, we put the boat on the beach every afternoon by 2 o'clock and spent the rest of the afternoon either catching a lobster or fish. Uh, so we had rice and onions, uh, rum, <laughs> garlic, salt, and a little propane two-burner stove. And that was the challenge, just to, to make it from island to island and to feed ourselves. So, you know, you don't, you don't need 10,000 miles of ocean to have a wilderness and experience. You just need a little boat. And this was, uh, time is marching along here now, I, I retired in 1997, and this was the class of ship that I was on the last three years that I, that I worked for this company. Um, this is the sister ship to the Exxon Valdez. There were two of those ships, 987 feet long, 
166 foot beam and uh, it drew 64 feet loaded. This one, she's in ballast. There's no oil in that ship. That's why you see so much bottom paint. But a huge ship. And most of that, the, my time on that class, we loaded in Saudi Arabia, uh, Yemen, or Egypt, and sailed mostly around the Cape of Good Hope and discharged in those deep water ports in, um, in Europe. Um, either Marseille, uh, Le Havre, Southampton or Rotterdam. Those are the ones that can take big ships. And then after I retired, uh, my husband and I decided we wanted a bigger boat and we wanted a bigger project. <laughs> so we picked this 50 footer. She actually picked us. And I've had this boat 18 years now. This is what she looked like when we brought her home. I can remember we found her in Cape Cod. Um, we motored the boat. We anchored in Block Island, and all the other boats around us were like, no, no. Because <laughs> we looked like Haitian refugees. I mean, it was really in bad shape. But we immediately stripped the boat, took all the rubber rails off, pulled all the through hole fittings out of it, uh, wooded the boat, and made a list. We gutted the whole interior and did everything from scratch. All new tanks, all new wiring, all new plumbing. Uh, Everything, new through hole fittings, new rig. And it's it's hard work doing a wooden boat like that, but you know, what you learn out of it, there's an old saying that the boat, you know, the boat builds the man, the man doesn't build the boat, and that's or woman. I mean it totally it is true. You grow into every challenge that you have, you grow into it, you have to figure it out, you have to master it. So my husband did most of the woodwork and I did the systems. I, I designed the electrical load and did all the wiring and the plumbing and still to this day, I still have the boat on the mechanic. So that's what she looks like. Yep, yep. It's exactly like doing a house. You know, somebody buys an old crappy fallen down house. If you have the vision and you understand that there's something significant about the house, you just go at it. You make a list and you execute. But it's hard work. There she is underway. So then after I retired, you know, there's not a lot. I, 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 we were living in East Hampton and I, I really wanted to stay here, but there's, there's nothing here for, I mean, I know, we all know people with master's degrees who are working as personal assistants. There's not anything here for a retired navigator. So I'm like, well, what can I do to, to stay here? I tried the historical society. I tried a, I had tried a gardening business. And we struck this idea. Of, and and I, I, I'm very aware that I'm now following the direct track of what my father did, owning a charter boat. But it just made sense. We had this great equity, and we put her to work. And we started a company called East End Charters. And uh, what we do is we match people with different boats for special occasions. <clears throat> we do special parties. Of course, Greenport is an oyster growing place, so you know we always try to include nice fresh oysters. Uh, we do very pretty Hamptons parties. We have several boats in Sag Harbor that I broker. Uh, we do. <laughs> Should I back up? I can't use this. The, the, I didn't invent this. This is called trashing the dress. It's a it's a trend where an older woman kind of makes fun of the idea of wearing a virginal white dress. So during the ceremony, you trash the dress. That's what she's doing. <laughs> uh, we do weddings on board. I, I am now an ordained minister, so I can perform ceremonies on board. <laughs> We do a lot of uh, best friend parties, uh, you know, special uh, family reunions, all, all kinds of, any time that a group needs a boat to get out and, and really be in the natural environment, I can't think of a better way to have a bonding experience. Um, most of the boats that I, I broker are classic boats because I, I believe in that aesthetic and this one we use, a lot of people want to go golfing on Fisher's Island, so we send them to the golf course on this boat, 
The boat drives up in the golf course, they play golf, they come back on the boat. We do a lot of corporate work where they want a fancy boat to bring everybody. This boat's certified for 38 people, so they can have a big party on board. We do a lot of photo shoots. Um, we've done a couple moving pictures on the boat. That was very interesting work, uh, but mostly fashion work. Fireworks parties. Um, I lost my husband. Uh, we were married for 32 years, and he died in 2013 of leukemia. That was a giant hole in my being, but um, I try to be grateful that we were together for 32 years. And then I, I it was casting about trying to figure out, well, where do I go from here? And I decided that I should pay back. And I started mentoring young women. So these gals both now are licensed. They These two happen to come from the Harbor School, which is a vocational school for high school for mariners on Governor's Island. So they came out and spent time working for us. Cute as a button. This gal spent uh, most of the winter with me on the boat. She was uh, quite young at the time and now she's a, she's a very good captain. She's working on beautiful super yachts in Europe right now. But it's, it's a really, it's something that's lacking, this sort of one-on-one -on -one support system for women. Uh, and it's really wonderful for these young gals to have an older person not just to model themselves after, but also to share with and articulate their fears and their, what they're excited about and double check to see if they're on the right course. So, it's, and it's very satisfying for me. I do the Fresh Air Fund also. This is uh, a young woman who has got enough seat time now. She's going to be sitting for a license very soon. She spent seven months on the boat with me. She was quite a mechanic. And one of the things that I want to make sure these girls learn is that uh, life is what you make it. And you don't have to whine and complain if there's not a supermarket around the block. You're hungry enough, you can go out and you can catch your own dinner. You can grow your own vegetables. You can make your own yogurt. You can learn how to make bread. So they come away with this whole new empowerment that they didn't even know that existed. And look at the look on her face. You know, she's jacked. It's a spiny lobster, yeah. And this is uh, the gal that I'm working with now. She's now the captain of Surprise, the boat that we restored. And so I stay home and I do all the bookings and she runs the boat and she's incredible. She's been with the boat three years now and boy, she's, she's a Cracker Jack uh, captain. So there we are, that's Anchored Off Orient. So, you know, I, I just, uh, just want to say that there's, all these groups are always the same. I, I'm very happy to give these library talks, but there's never anybody in the room under 30. <laughs> So you guys can take this message home to anybody you know who is under 30 and tell them even if you're a gal and you, you love boats and you want to work on ships, just go for it. Just go after it and seize life by the horns and as long as you're following your passion, you'll be okay. So thank you again for coming. if anybody has any questions or if there's something I didn't cover. Uh -huh. we, we all know the sea is a uh, demanding mistress. Tell us about your scariest day at sea. <laughs> well, when I was at school, there was an expression, a quote from Felix Reisenberg, who was, this thing was posted everywhere. It's in the dorms, in the mess halls, in the auditorium, and it said, the sea is selective, slow in recognition of effort and aptitude, but fast in sinking the unfit. And one of the things about going to sea is it is humbling. It makes you feel this small, 
And then after a while, you begin to embrace the idea that you are insignificant, which is really healthy because that perspective change is what enables you to sort of go with the flow and deal with things as they come up. The scariest thing that happened to me, I was sleeping in my room in a hammock because this ship was a notorious roller. And in the middle of the, it, I was on the 8 to 12 watch, so I think I was taking a nap in the middle of the afternoon. And the whole ship started making this incredible vibrating sound. And I woke up, and I looked at the curtains were swinging out into midair. And something was definitely wrong. I got put my feet on the deck, and I couldn't stand up. The whole ship was going up and down, up and down. I, I couldn't stand. Uh, we... Nobody knew what was going on. In fact, we were in an earthquake. We were 30 miles from the 6.7 earthquake in the middle of the Gulf of Alaska on a loaded oil tanker. So this went on for about three minutes or so. And I finally was able to pull a pair of pants on under my nightgown. And I went up the to the bridge. And I could barely get up the stairs. And when I opened the door, the whole uh, chart room was filled with orange smoke, like orange fog you couldn't see through. So I kind of railed along, and then I went out into the wheelhouse, and there was nobody there. It was like, like a Rod Sterling, I mean, what was happening? Nobody knew what was happening. And as I was going out to the bridge wing, the door that opened to the side of the ship, um, there was... Uh, somebody came on the radio, and, and I heard on the VHF radio, stand clear, we have a fire in the engine room, we're experiencing excessive vibration. As soon as I heard that, I ran out, the captain and the chief mate, they thought a, a piece fell off the repeller, one of the blades fell off. And they were standing there looking aft, trying to figure it out. And as soon as we heard that on the radio, we realized that, you know, we were experiencing exactly what that other ship was feeling, and we, and we knew it was an earthquake. And we surveyed the whole ship. We shut everything down and surveyed the whole ship. And there was there were some cracks in the steel, but nothing in the cargo tanks. We weren't leaking anything at all. We were perfectly seaworthy. But the empty tanks on the ship uh, cracked. In the, the four peak, which is the um, empty void space sort of under where the anchor is, there's no oil stored up there had a 14-foot crack in it, right down the middle, like that. <laughs> you can imagine the forces that would make a three-quarter inch piece of steel open up like that. So it was pretty humbling and very scary. And I, that, by far, is the scariest thing that ever happened to me. Out on the end of the bridge wings are man-overboard rings with a smoke marker on it. So if somebody falls off the ship, the first thing you do is you pull a pin, the whole thing just falls right off. And the vibration just knocked him right out, of, just bounced him right out of the brackets. So it was crazy. And then we went to San Francisco, we pumped all the oil off the ship, we washed the ship, and went to the shipyard. And experts came down and they looked at the inside of the ship and where the deck and the starboard side of the ship met, all those brackets were all bent exactly in the same angle. So forensically, they were able to figure out exactly where the waves came from, how far we were away, how, how strong it was. We were kind of like a test study. It was very interesting. You know, after we got over being scared, it was interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you uh, learn how to scuba dive for years? I did learn how to scuba dive. I actually learned how to scuba dive from a Ocean Lifeguard in East Hampton. Uh, and then I, I had Lyme disease and I did a lot of IV antibiotics for the Lyme disease and it somehow screwed up my inner ear. And I, I can still free dive with a mask and snorkel. I'm good to about 10 feet, but I, I can't go any farther than that anymore. Yeah. But I, I love diving. I love being, I like anything that changes perspective. I love caves. I love going under the water. I love being up in the air. Yeah. You mentioned the, what I phrase, this crotchety old captain who was your first captain. Mm -hmm. Was there a time in there you began to realize you were being accepted? One particular time? In general. Like, 
a good bruise. I'm not going to put so many false bruises. It's a good trick. Yes. You know, I, I, I know all the guys. The guys know all of me, and this, this is going to work. Well, every ship that I joined was like a rehash of the last one. So I would come to a ship, and I would be a new person. And I think any person gets tested because it's human nature to sort of establish a hierarchy. There's always a whipping boy, and there's always the top dog, and everybody else is in between. So every single ship that I went through, there was always that moment where, yes, I won through sheer competency, or sometimes just whatever it takes. I mean, I used to be one of the boys. I could tell a dirty joke as good as the rest of them. But whatever it took to be accepted and to be successful and competent is what I would do. And then usually after every ship towards the end, I'm like, okay, well, we, all, we, can, we can do this together. But I, one significant example of what you're talking about, we were in a shipyard in Singapore. And the, usually the ship has a representative, a management person, and the shipyard has a manager. And they liaise to protect the interests of both parties in the contract. Well, the shipyard superintendent was a Chinese guy who was a young buck and not very tall and really thought a lot about himself. And when the shipyard, he demanded that he get a real mate. He didn't want to work with me. He asked for a real mate. And our ship representative was cool. I mean, fortunately, I had an advocate. And he said, well, this is all we have, take her or leave her, right? And we had to go down. And our job was, we had a clipboard. We had all these jobs on it. And just like a contractor in the house. So we were supposed to go down in these big tanks, probably climb down about, I don't know, 75 feet down a vertical ladder, climb over these big structures, climb up the reach rods hand over hand and count pins on the universal joints in the reach rods. So the first tank, and plus it's 105 degrees. So the first tank we go down, he really thought that he was just going to stone maul me and he wouldn't have to work with me. So he didn't bring his clipboard. So we got all the way to the bottom of the tank and I was in very good shape because I had to be. He went all the way to the bottom and he's breathing hard and he's sweating like a pig. And I'm like, Where's your clipboard? It's like, oh, I left it up above. I said, I'll wait for you. <laughs> so he went all the way up, and then he had to come all the way down again. And we did our job, and then we climbed back up, and we went to the next tank, and we went down, and we went up, and climbed around, and I wasn't even out of breath. And by the third tank, he said, can we do the rest tomorrow? <laughs> And again, you know, it's sink or swim. You've got to figure out whatever it takes. And, you know, that's, I think, why a lot of women don't stay with it, because you're constantly proving yourself. And it's just like, how can you hold the water back? Every, every single ship, it's the same thing over and over again. Um, but again, that was 30 years ago. Hopefully things are better now. But when I first started out, we didn't have any... No support at all. We had no human resources department to go to. They wanted us to fail just like everybody else. There were no harassment laws. There was no definition for sexual harassment. And I can remember sitting around the dinner table, and these were college-educated guys. They said, well, I don't get it. I, what is it? What, what is sexual harassment? If I tell you a dirty joke, is that sexual harassment? I'm like, well, it's only if you do it to make me feel bad. <laughs> Simple, right? But they just really had to like flesh it out. And finally, I just started to develop this idea that, say you do something weird, and it's printed in a newspaper, and your wife and your children see it, and they're embarrassed. That's, that's pretty much harassment right there. So, but like I said, we over here. How many seamounts did you have to be on the boat? when you first went and then you got the second degree and then you got the third degree. How many sea miles, uh, blue water sea miles did you take? They measure it in days. So you need 365 days in each five-year period on that license. And then you can, that allows you to sit for the next license and same thing all the way up. Right now I have a 1,600-ton captain's license and an unlimited chief mate's license. 
if you know what is the proportion of male to female <coughs> students in, Amer in some of the maritime academies now? Today. I, I, I know it's more, I would guess 10 or 15 percent, but I, 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 I'm only guessing. I really don't know it's the still answer. Only, it's yeah. near, uh, it was only 4 or 5 percent when I went, <laughs> and then it didn't even boost very much the whole time I was at sea. Because there's constant turnover, and that means everybody from the stewards department and the cooks and the bedroom cleaners all the way up to the captain. And I think it's significant that they send a woman to outer space before they made a woman captain in the United States Merchant Marine. Are you part of the Merchant Marine? Yes. Yeah. The Merchant Marine, I, I, it's confusing, but it sounds like an armed forces division, but yeah, Merchant mar Mariners are the ones who carry cargo, merchant cargo, commercial ships. Yeah. I never captained one of these big ships. I was always a senior deck officer. Uh, I chose not to become a captain because I had some issues with demanding, and I really didn't think that it was right for corporations to keep slashing manning levels on ships. And I, I was part of a company that busted unions, and I was really more of a labor rights person than I was ship captain material. So for that reason, I never became ship captain. I didn't feel that I could support the company policy. Is there anything being done? Are you involved in recruiting women, young women at schools or anything to enter this field? Not formally. But in my circle, my networking circle, there's always somebody who needs help. There's always somebody who wants to get better. There's always a person advocating for a young woman. And somehow they get steered to me. I'm thinking maybe next year I might like to do a camp, like a, a one-week camp. Not just for young women, but for, for anybody. You know, there's, there's a real need for couples counseling on sailboats because there's a lot of yelling and screaming. And, <laughs> and it, it doesn't have to be that way. There's one particular motion that makes me quite seasick, and I'm not embarrassed to talk about it. I'm not really good with pitching, which is this. On a small boat, if we're pitching, and I have to turn upside down and go in a small locker and fix something, it makes me throw up. But I know it. I bring a bucket with me and I throw up and I still do the job, but I have to get back. How did you deal with the solitude of being on that ship and did you have your own cabin? Yes. Officers have their own cabin. And frankly, I was happy for the solitude. You know, there's not a lot of time to sit around and think about it because you're standing watch for eight hours a day, two four-hour shifts, and you're doing four or six hours of overtime every day. Then you go to the gym, you do your laundry, and you have your meals, and that's your whole day. So, uh, I, you know, I, I'm a reader, and I really enjoyed having that kind of solitude, but um, what was more difficult than anything is that it because I was kind of most of, most of the time either the only woman on board or one of two maybe, it's very difficult to have regular normal fellowship with all the guys. You have to stay apart and you have to keep to yourself and you have to draw a big red line around how much interaction there's going to be. That was my key to success, which could be lonely. We were attacked by Greenpeace once. <laughs> and it was definitely piracy. Um, they came with big power boats and zoomed around the ship, and there was a helicopter filming the whole thing. And they had suction cups, and they stuck them on the side of the ship, and then painted graffiti all over the ship with man helpers, big rollers, painted all over the ship. And <clears throat> it, it was a message, it was an environmental message. They were trying to, you know, people hate oil tankers, but look around. They want plastic. They want to burn SUV giant amounts of gasoline. I mean, we live in such a consumptive world, but yet, paradoxically, they hate oil tankers that deliver the very product that they can't wait to buy. So that's what their message was, you know, don't let me spill, and, you know, all this environmental stuff. 
but they they really that's what they do is they try to make an incident and then they get it out on TV and that's how they get their message out. But um, we called right away. By then we had satellite phones on the ship, so the old man called the office and they said, well, you know, what do we do? And they said, don't engage. Be nice. Now the sailors couldn't wait to have this war. They got the fire hoses out. They were going to blast these guys. I mean, they couldn't wait to engage. And, you know, it's like calling off a pack of wild dogs. It's hard to get everybody calm down. We're not going to hurt anybody here. And we just let a lot of water dribble over the edge of the ship to, to keep the paint from sticking. Yeah. And we're like, how are we going to be nice? That's crazy. So we tied Coke cans on strings and lowered them down like party favors. <laughs> <laughs> but real pirates, no, nothing. We had a lot, of, a lot of guys trying to get on the ship and steal things at anchor. They, especially in Indonesia, and, you know, they, they try to climb up the anchor chain and steal stuff. But, you know, you just post guards, everybody walks around looking for them. What was the most treacherous area that you've been in? Weather-wise? Yeah. I would say going the the big seas that can pick up and the Alguel's current going around the, the southern part of Africa were very scary. Um, even slowing the ship down the ship would come out of the water and lurch and then fall down. It was really very big seas and very scary. Sharp, steep, and mean, nasty waves. How long have you been in the station? 50 feet at least. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 I mean, everybody thinks that a thousand foot ship's not effective, but what happens is it's a thousand feet long and you might get one big wave in the middle and the two ends are sagging. Or you might get waves on both ends and the center part is sagging. So you have to time it so that the body of the ship is supported evenly if you go too fast or too slow. It, it's scary. Yeah, it's very scary. <clears throat> With all your sailing, where's the favorite protocol that you have? What's your most, the best thing you said the most fun when you sail? Ships are, uh, ships are on, on boats. Uh, sailboats. Sailboats. I love the Exumas in the Bahamas. Why is that? Uh, it's, it's very shallow, so if you're on the right boat, again, I'm, I'm a big fan of creating your own wilderness by having the right boat for the right environment, and most people can't go to these great places because their boats draw too much water. So you can escape the crowds. I mean, there's twice as many people on the planet now as there were when I was born. You, no matter where you go, there are a lot of other boats but not in the Exumas. It's still some very beautiful, very natural places, and I love turquoise. <laughs> yeah. Yes? You made it to a good place to end. All, I think we all want to go to sea. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pat. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.